coming up next on the podcast, Alex, Caitlin, and I break down the trailer for the forthcoming docu-series on Netflix entitled Sprint, which is all about the top 100 and 200 meter track stars that will be running in Paris this summer. Then we dig into this unusual pairing of Tinder, the dating app, and a running app. And finally, our big topic of the week, eight reasons why you shouldn't run a marathon and a few reasons why you should. All right, let's get into the show. All right, I'm joined by my colleagues, Alex and Caitlin. Uh, We're going to have a big discussion about why you shouldn't run a marathon. Kind of... uh, kind of an unexpected twist on the usual conversation, uh, why you shouldn't do something, especially considering it's our namesake marathon handbook, but there's a bunch of really good reasons. And as many of us are embarking on our 16 ish week marathon journey in the very near future, if you're running a fall marathon as I am, uh, maybe that thoughts creeping into your head right now. So (laughs) we'll unpack that topic and also finish it off on a positive note with why we think you should run a marathon for sure. But before that, there's a couple of news items uh, that have crossed the desk here at Marathon Handbook that our colleague uh, Jesse Carveth has written about for the site. And the first one, the much anticipated Netflixification of track and field just in time for the Paris Olympics this summer is the new docu-series called sprint we got our first trailer and we've gotten a release date july 2nd for this series alex a are you pumped for it like are you going to do like an all-night binge if they drop all 10 episodes you know midnight eastern time july 2nd is this a stay up until midnight and watch and b who are you most excited to see uh spot lit or spotlighted in this series. Ooh, I'm actually very excited for it. I think I'm going to binge it, not overnight, because I just can't pull it off. I'm 28. I can't do that anymore. Oh, boy. But, oh, here we go. <laughs> I, you know, I have this thing where I usually hate watch running or track related content because it's fiction and they get the little things wrong. My hopes are mm-hmm. high for this because Netflix is on this kick of like producing awesome sport documentaries I think since the last dance, the basketball documentary about the Chicago Bulls a couple years ago, they've just been yes. on a tear. And now that it's coming out with track and not just track, but the most, the most obnoxious and fun and awesome part of it, which is sprinting. And I'm saying this as a distance runner. I know the entertainment value that exists in sprinting. I'm very fired up. And I also think they picked an awesome cast of characters. You know, there was this whole thing that when Usain Bolt retired, we thought, oh, Maybe maybe sprinting is going to fall into a low. We don't have any personalities anymore. And I think that's total bullshit. We're now at a point where there are like four, five, six top contenders on the on the male side and on the female side. You have Shakari Richardson in it. You have Noah Lyles in it, Fred Curley, their little rivalry happening. I think, what was your second question? Who am I most excited to see? I think Noah Lyles. Yeah. Um he already did the media rounds. Like he was on Jimmy Fallon, which is a pretty big deal. You don't see a track and field athlete on major media outlets on major shows. He's already dropping wicked quotes. Like his one in the trailer was, if you don't have main, if you don't have main character energy, track and field ain't for you, which is always what we said on our cross country team too. And I think Lyles is, is the perfect guy to put on the pedestal. So yeah, I'm I'm really excited to see. I have very high hopes, which sometimes is dangerous to get into a series with high hopes. But now nah, I think I'm going to watch it as an appreciative fan. Uh, Caitlin, are are you uh, are you and I going to do a watch along? Are we going to do? I don't know if they even a lot do that anymore. Like it was like the like watch party thing oh, during can we watch the it pandemic. Together? Yeah, we could watch it together. We could like and just like <laughs> sort of live chat the whole thing. Um, Certainly we should do something actually, now that I'm saying that we should do something around the release of this docuseries where we have, I mean, certainly we're going to, we're going to talk about it in the podcast when it comes out for sure. Of course. But, I can't wait to see it. I'm yeah. excited. Yeah. But, and we should maybe, I don't know, we'll write it. We'll write a review or, uh, I feel like there's, I feel like there needs to be some sort of like live ish unpacking of everything that goes down. Um, are you, have you, 
you have you watched any of the other Netflix uh, sports sports docs that they've done in, in the last couple um, of years? Have I? I've watched um, I've watched Unchained. Well, the first uh, seasons of the Tour de France one, and I mean, the Last Dance was incredible. I could have watched it again. The Michael Jordan, um, <clears throat> the Michael Jordan documentary that was amazing. That was so inspiring. I loved it. Um, so yeah, I've watched those ones. I didn't get to see the Drive to Survive. Which I, did you guys get a chance to watch that one? Yeah, I've watched a little bit of it. Uh, yeah. um, I'm not sure if you ever not, Alex, but it's uh, extremely well produced. And obviously, I think the anticipation, the hope here is with the track with Sprint is that it's going to inject the same amount of juice into athletics that Drive to Survive did for F1, where particularly in the United States, I think it woke up a huge fan or like there was there was a not a pre-existing fan base really in the US and then it was this like great discovery like oh there's this really interesting motorsport F1 that everyone <laughs> else in the world pays a lot of attention to and has a lot of money and there's all these like flamboyant characters and I think the hope is there with that for for track and field as well. Uh, do you guys think okay so like with with these docu series with um what they call uh scripted nonfiction or re reality TV. It's often fairly structured and in the edit or the sort of the production strategy is to create protagonists, antagonists to flesh out all of these characters. And in some cases, these characters come off as being a certain way that they aren't actually in real life. I'm really curious to see if we get any villains out of this or if anyone emerges out of this series as a real celebrity and kind of breaks through as a celebrity athlete that previously was relatively unknown. Hmm. Do, you, do you guys, do you have a, do you have a pick as to somebody who like, maybe the three of us know who this person is because we follow track and field, but maybe like the, the real casual would not have previously heard of this person or doesn't know much about them. And then they become elevated because of this. Hmm. I think, Noah Lyles and Shakari Richardson. See, I, I struggle to I struggle to know if they're mainstream now or it's just because I'm in track. But I know Shakari was a pretty big character because of what happened with her her failed drug test when they found cannabis in, in her system. Other than that, I think both of them are are personalities that can't not become famous after this. But I think two people that I'm quite sure no one knows about are um, Shelly Ann Fraser Price and Fred Curley. And both, I think, have the potential to be made by this series. Fraser Price just has an incredible pedigree. She's won so much. But because it's track and field, I think the mainstream person might not know about her. And Fred Curley is the underdog who's just been into, just discovered that he's like quite good at the 100 meter after being a 400 meter runner for a long time. And He's a little more obscure, let's say, than, than Noah Lyles. Like, he hasn't been in the media all that much. And with their growing beef, I think those two men and also these two women could be uh, could become stars. And and Noah Lyles already is one, right? I, I You could argue that he's one of the better-known athletes now who's going to the Olympics this year. I think what we'll get is a lot of people who weren't planning on watching track in the Olympics watching track in the Olympics. Mm. Like that, that, I really feel like that's what happens after these sort of documentaries. I think it'll be really cool to see people interested in like, I can't miss the hundred meter dash. Like I feel, I, I feel like it's definitely going to bring some interest to the sport, which is great for us. Yeah. And like <laughs> at this time, so needed. Actually, it was really interesting yeah. to see that Usain Bolt was included in the, in the documentary and, and featured pretty prominently in the trailer. And it's like, oh shit, Usain Bolt. Okay. So they landed him. They've got him in this series as kind of a, um, a voice of God like character, right? That's, you know, sitting in the darkened room, giving his perspective uh, on the 100 meter and 200 meter. And I think that's going to be really cool to gain that perspective from him uh, as, you know, he's the, he's the looming presence over all of this, that he's the, he's the long shadow that's been cast over sprinting in the last however many years now. And uh, I think, yeah, a guy like Fred Curley could be, emerge as a really, intriguing character that people will know maybe not necessarily a household name going into it but maybe exiting this because he's a big personality really interested to see how 
this series handles him dumping ASICs very quickly, mm-hmm. very unceremoniously, like basically on the eve of the Olympic uh, qualifiers coming up for the U.S. So he's going to be basically uh, unattached going into the Olympics and can kind of say and do whatever he wants to do and wear whatever spikes he wants to wear, whatever gear he wants to wear um, and speak pretty freely. Be interesting to see how they, they stick handle that. And uh, just like a little kind of like a thing to flag here is that ASICS is a major sponsor of world athletics, the governing body of the sport. And be really interesting to see how Netflix, World Athletics, the IOC all kind of handle this awkward moment. That's something to definitely watch out for. Too, it'll be too bad if they edit anything out, but he's very outspoken, so I'm sure he'll 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 let us know on social media. He'll get he it does. in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Though I wonder yeah. if it's too soon before the release of it. Like I wonder if everything is wrapped oh, right, up yeah. before what mm-hmm. what happened with Curly because that was just you know last week or a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Good question. Oh, good point. Yeah. They often shoot this stuff like right up to the bitter end um, before they turn it around. So who knows? Hopefully it's in there because it's, it's an interesting detail. And I'm also really interested to see, you mentioned Shikari Richardson. I'm really interested, really interested to see how they frame her in this story and this, in this series. Cause in the trailer, she's obviously a super flamboyant character and a really like just the, the camera, like you just sort of sucked into her presence. Right. Yep. Um, <laughs> but also she could very easily be turned into kind of a little bit of a, um, a villainous character too. Right. Cause she's got that real sort of bravado to her. And I noticed in the trailer that kind of contrasted her to Shelly Ann Pre- Fraser price. who's was like, I'm a multi-time mother. Olympian and a mother, <laughs> yeah. you know, and it's like, she seems so sweet. They seem like complete opposite. <laughs> yeah. And that's not by <laughs> accident, demeanor. right? Yeah. Yeah. That edit is totally on purpose to create yep. that kind of contrast. Uh, so yeah, I'd be really, and also, although all of these athletes have had a fair amount of publicity and attention over the years, it's probably a much smaller scale than, if this were to blow up on Netflix and become like a big mainstream media phenomenon, which it could. And if that's the case, it'll be interesting to see how they handle how they're portrayed. Right. And whether or not they were invited into kind of the uh, production decision-making. Uh, yeah. In if they could weigh in. Yeah. So they could see the cuts and right. whether, cause documentaries used to do that, right. Where they'd be like, you're not allowed to see the footage before it's out. You know, it's like, you don't have control over, over that. And maybe I think that's probably changed. I would guess that some of these people in Nike and Adidas and whomever else have seen a cut of this stuff beforehand. So, but super exciting. It's going to be awesome. So it's get It drops July 2nd on Netflix and, uh, and we'll definitely be talking about it in the immediate aftermath. So uh, make sure you subscribe to the pod for that. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. All right, so we've done the Netflix component. Let's pivot to the chill. (laughs) Full disclosure, we workshopped that one before we hit record. (laughs) Uh, Our next topic, another newsy one that we thought we would chatter about for a couple of minutes before we get into our main subject for the day, uh, is this unusual collaboration between the running app Runna, R-U-N-N-A, and Tinder, the dating app. They have partnered up to host a and collaborate on a couple of events that are aimed at connecting people, I guess, romantically through running. And the, the first events take place in around the London area, but I imagine if this is a success locally for Runa and Tinder that it will expand. Um, obviously this is targeting a younger demographic, younger than Caitlin and I. So we'll go to our, uh, our, our in- embedded, our embedded Gen Z reporter, Alex Sear. Uh, what's your, what's your take on this? Mm. I consider myself a young millennial, but that's neither here nor there. I think this is going to take off. Uh, I live in Toronto, Canada, which is a smaller version of London, let's say, cosmopolitan, diverse city. 
And the saying that my girlfriend and I have, and I'm a runner, she is not, is that lately has been that running groups are the new dating apps. We know people who have met in the last couple of months at their running clubs. And I think it's going to take off. The other thing I'm hearing a lot, (laughs) I feel like a Gen Z correspondent. This is awful. (laughs) But from my (laughs) friends is that, you know, three, four years ago, there was only one playbook for dating. And that was taking, taking a partner out on a date, right? Like you go to dinner, have drinks, maybe go to a movie. It was pretty classic. Probably the same thing you old dogs did back in your day. Nowadays, (laughs) nowadays it's different. I think people care to drink a little bit less. There's a lot less drinking happening, right? So I think people who are dating are looking to find different ways to hang out with someone and have fun that, you know, has nothing to do with, with drinking, running being one of them. A lot of people have picked up running since the pandemic. So yeah, I think we're getting to the point now where that might be a new avenue for dating. And it is different because see, I didn't tell my girlfriend I was a runner until like, I don't know, six months after dating her because I thought it was weird. And now everyone's flexing that. So different times. I'm, I'm, I think it's going to take off. I think it's an, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I think that if I were to use some sort of a system to try to find, so I would want to look for someone who is a runner. And I think it's a couple of funny things that I've seen. Well, first of all, and we have, my husband and I, we have a running club here in Costa Rica. I've mentioned it before. And it is not based on, it's based on learning how to run, becoming a better runner, uh, having a good time while doing it, getting PRs, like trail running. Um, and just from having the running club, we have a handful of marriages <laughs> that have come out of the running club. And this, like I said, it wasn't planned like this, but we have marriages, we have partnerships there. We've got a lot of people who have met and gotten together because of the running club. And so I think this is a great idea because I've seen it in the flesh happen organically in our running club and have seen a lot of happy couples uh, come out of the running club. So that's been really nice for us and really nice for the club. And obviously, I don't know. So I think, I think it's going to be, I think it's a great idea. I think people are going to have a lot of fun. And the other point that I was thinking about, and this is a little, I don't know, I've seen people in the running club who have partners who are not runners. And I'm not saying that you have to be partnered up with a runner. If you're a runner, you don't. I guess depending maybe on how serious you take it and how much trouble you want to have in your relationship. But I see a lot of um, clashing going on sometimes (laughs) between going for a trail run and leaving at five in the morning and driving an hour and a half and going on an ultra trail run and being there for three hours, going out to breakfast, lunch afterward, and you're getting home at two, three in the afternoon. And I have seen that once in a while people clash over this. And so (laughs) being with a non-runner and being a runner who really likes to put a lot of time into it, I think it absolutely can work. But I think that sometimes it provides some relationship challenges that I have seen uh, through the running club. So I think, um, it could be great for those runners who take running super seriously or not even, but just want someone to understand their running commitments. And I'm thinking back to the, to the reel that Alex did about going on vacation with a runner and not being a runner. It was so hilarious. But I was thinking, you know, when I go on vacation, what would happen if I were with someone who didn't understand that I need to go get my morning run in in the morning? You know, it would be, it would be tricky. It would be like that give and take. And I would have to probably sacrifice some things in the relationship. (laughs) I will sacrifice some of the running for the relationship. So anyway, um, I think that it has a lot of positive points for those of us maybe, or people who are looking for runners and it has worked. Well, for those of you who are here for the dating advice, I will say one thing (laughs) that the toughest part of my relationship with a non-runner happened in those first six months when I wasn't clear about what my intentions were with running. And once I was way more honest and I said, look, this is something I have to do every day. She understood. Then, and then things were smooth. It was about telling the truth and being honest with her. But there is a weird middle when you try to masquerade as a non-athlete or a non-runner. And if you are in that middle and you're listening, get out of it now. Pick a side. Be clear <laughs> about your intentions. There's no place to be more clear than this run club, I guess. 
Because otherwise she's going to start to think that you're like some sort of weird degenerate gambler or you're like actually dating. <laughs> yeah. It's like, does women? Alex need an like, oil change of Canadian tire every week? Like what this is <laughs> driving? <laughs> so, so Caitlin, your advice to Alex would be slide the girlfriend a training plan and just be like, yes, couch to 5k. Give it a Get try. her into it. Exactly. But she seems already really understanding. So that's amazing. If you're in that kind of situation, it's perfect. But there are people I feel who do not like to see their partner going out as much and being so committed to running. Caitlin, did you meet your husband running? Um, we like to kind of make that story up and pretend we say, yeah, we saw each other on a trail and we ran past each other and it was, you know, magic. No, we didn't meet running, but we did meet, um, with friends of ours. My, one of my friends and her husband was one of, is one of my husband's very close friends. And so we kind of got set up, but it was based on the fact that we both like music and we both, and Victor, he runs a lot and Caitlin is starting to run. And, you know, so it was kind of like set up, but we didn't, it wasn't like that. We met on the trail or we met in a running club, but we were kind of almost set up because of running. Yeah. I met, I met my wife at a race. You so, did? Yeah. Yeah. So there we go. There you we have go. that it story. Works. It works. Run, the Tinder, Rana, you figured it out. You've yes. cracked the code. <laughs> Only thing not to sort of uh, be the, the 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 cloud hanging over this, though. I just imagine this is like a like the safety stalkery elements of this. I know we did a story several months ago about Strava's issues when they started to open up, like a like they did a DM thing, and it was just like bad idea because people are getting harassed left and right i i think that that's the only thing i would be i would have a big question mark about and good luck to run a kind of navigating that as a running app but yeah totally fascinating turn of events uh yeah mm. the uh, good thing and running the good thing about runners is that they can sniff out a non-runner very quickly when they don't match their level of nerddom and so if that's my advice to people who go there, if someone has seems to have no idea what they're talking about and they're not wearing running shoes, get away. That's a creep. They're not there for the right reasons. Sage words from our Gen Z correspondent <laughs> at the front lines of, uh, of the apps. All right, we're going to take a break and then we'll come back with our big topic of the day. Why you shouldn't run a marathon. Be right back. All right, and we're back. Our main topic for today, an unusual one. I think it's going to be a fun one, guys. It's why you should not run a marathon. And this is, we're talking about this because, uh, Caitlin, on Tuesday, Tuesday morning, you sent out a newsletter, and that was the subject line of the email that got sent out to our oh. subscribers. Uh, and it's a, based on a story that our colleague Thomas did a couple of years ago. And we decided to, to send it out just because of the timing, because many runners are now embarking on the beginning of training for a fall marathon. And his, his article, Thomas's article is really good. It's, it's basically a listicle that kind of breaks down a variety of different uh, reasons why you should maybe reconsider doing a marathon. And we'll get, we'll go through each one of them and talk about what our thoughts, our takes on that. But looking behind the curtain here, looking at the, the data, so many people read that story. So many people clicked on that email, opened it up and clicked on that story a lot of interest, a lot of feedback, crazy amounts of traffic. I think maybe the most traffic we've ever seen <laughs> from any of our individual email sends before. So clearly it struck a nerve. So we thought we'd talk about it. Um, so guys, I mean, okay, so let's do the full disclosure here. I am a dyed in the wool devotee of the marathon. I am basically, it's my, it's my passion in life. Caitlin, you're a marathon dabbler. You recently <laughs> recently ran a marathon, uh, yeah. but you're you're the you're the queen of the trails. Um, 
Yeah, I, I would say the first reason why you shouldn't run a marathon is because you should run an ultra marathon. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> and then Alex Sear is a recovering track addict and cross-country dude who is now exploring a new side of himself with the 5 and the 10K on the road and is marathon curious. Correct? Correct. Okay, so this is going to be an interesting perspective from each of us, kind of different takes. Let's go through, it's eight reasons why you shouldn't run a marathon. We'll go through them, and then we'll put a little a little spin on it, and we'll talk about, I think, why, why you should run a marathon. I think there's no better way to finish than on a high note with why the decision you've made to run a marathon this fall is the right one. Okay, so number one, Thomas says, marathon running misses the point of running caitlin <laughs> discuss do you agree okay. with that i see the thing is is that i am also for the most part pro marathon pro races i can absolutely see the point of this because i feel like a lot of people run to kind of de like not everyone has their their sights set on racing or signing up for a race or signing up for an activity. They kind of get home at the end of the day or get up in the morning and just want to go out and run, um, de-stress or clear their mind or listen to a podcast or they're not really thinking about training specifically for something. And so I think maybe what, you know, what Thomas is saying here is just kind of a hanging out with your own thoughts or going out and having a conversation with a friend while you're running, getting exercise in, fresh air, sunlight. Um, so I think... Some people like to just be out there and run for fun and not think about racing. And so I think that it can get lost if you get, if you let yourself get too stressed out by training for a marathon. But I think, you know, and for, for another topic, I think for people who love marathons, like we love that, that pressure and that stress, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. I, not to step on number four, but jump, jumping ahead here, he's, he, rightly lists that you can get pretty much all the benefits of marathon running by just running, not worrying about the marathon, not worrying about having that big, massive goal hanging over your head and creating undue pressure on yourself. And that, you know, fundamentally, if you're just going out for a run to de-stress for fitness, um, as kind of like a, an overall lifestyle enhancer, yeah. like just, just go out for 20 or 30 minutes. It's probably going to do you just as well as the grind of, you know, fretting over whether or not you can fit in 10 miles in a, in an evening after a long day of work. Right. Um, right. Alex, what kind of, um, kind of mileage you've done, you've done like a lot bigger mileage, right? Like you've, you've done the equivalent of marathon training when in training for road races. Yeah, I think my highest mileage week was around 140 kilometers. So that's like, what, 90 miles in American speed? Yeah. Um, wow. Yeah, not sustained. You know, that would be the, the biggest week. I'd say when I'm training, I'm running about 110 kilometers. So the 70, 70 mile weeks. Yeah. And that's probably what like the average person listening right now who has done a marathon before or is training for a marathon, that might be around kind of where they're going to top out is around that kind of what, like, uh, yeah, 100, 100, 110 kilometers, 120 maybe tops, right? As their peak, 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 peak week. If that, and that's a seasoned veteran of the marathon, right? Um, and, and the smaller, the sort of, the, there's fewer people that go higher in volume than that. Very few people touch, I'd say, 140 or 50 kilometers a week. Um, yeah, that's huge, Alex. Wow. I yeah. need to help my mileage a little bit. <laughs> and that's a, that's a great segue wow. into number two, Alex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Running 26.2 miles is not great for your body. Um, not to pick on the injured guy, but I, I imagine that probably resonates with you, right? Mm, yeah. So I, I don't think we can talk about what is good and what isn't good for your body without getting into the, the, well, not to bring it back to number one, but the purpose of it, you know, I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm injured a lot in the last six years. I've been injured just about as much as I've been healthy, to be honest with you. And 
when I talk to people about it, especially non-runners, they think, well, you know, you could also just back off and go for easy runs when, when you feel like it. And sometimes that feels like a great idea, you know, guaranteeing that I would always be healthy and then have running at my disposal when, when, you know, I need to de-stress at the end of the day, I go run six kilometers, 30 minutes, and that's it. But I can't get myself to do that because then I feel like I'm missing the purpose of running for me. The purpose of running for me is to teach myself that I can chase something hard and push my limits and also do that for a long period of time. You know, Michael, you say it's your passion. So you look at it as like, it's your Everest, it's your Kilimanjaro, whatever. It's, it's, it's that thing that you want to accomplish for yourself. And so if you're not, if, if that, if that is your goal, you will find a way to get your body there. Even if it's a tough thing, obviously most people will run 26.2 miles. They'll be hurt somewhere. But a part of the journey is to find a way to get yourself strong enough to do it and do it well, right? Yeah. Injury is a tricky thing because I think, I don't think injury is inevitable in marathon training. Um, I, I personally haven't been injured in over a decade, uh, but, but that requires some, I think it requires some compromise. And I'm willing to admit that, that maybe I've left some, you know, a personal best here and there on the table because I didn't push quite as hard as I could have, but in order to stay healthy the entire time. But I think that was a good choice. I think so too. Yeah. You know, it's too bad. You don't get a, you don't, you know, uh, I think that we all, many marathon runners get obsessed with the PR, right? They get obsessed yep. with the big time. Uh, I, I have not escaped that. I do think about that. However, there should be some sort of reward or metric where you're like, where like on Strava, it should be, um, your resume. It's not just what your PR is. Uh, or what your recent marathon time is. It's like your full resume. It's like, how many marathons did you run? What was the average time? What's the sort of like, um, how are your performances graded against your, your fitness that season? Uh, do you have any DNSs or DNFs? I think all those things, like if we're going to do like full, like full truth Strava, it should be, you should have, you should also have to list like all the races you didn't make it to the start line or finish as well. But uh, I don't know if maybe people probably wouldn't be as attracted to Strava if they were forced <laughs> to do that. But um, yeah, I think that it's injury or uh, sort of working your way through challenge, physical challenges is definitely a part of the whole thing. And I think it's interesting. And I think it's a part of that kind of like knowing your body, developing that kind of more intuitive, deeper relationship with your physicality. I think that's not a bad thing. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to suggest that you should train until you injure yourself for the marathon. But, um, I think that it's an interesting thing to be able to, to push yourself to that place where you get to understand what your limits are for sure. Okay. So very different one. Number three, it's a dog and pony show. <laughs> now I, I get this vibe, right? Like I'm, I feel this one. Particularly if you've ever gone to, uh, Caitlin, have you ever run a major marathon? Like one of the. That's the thing. Like I'm thinking of the, like the excitement of Boston or something yeah. like that, but I haven't been involved in those moments, just watching Boston, which is already exciting. So being part of it, I can imagine that it's, that all of this is super exciting, but I, I, I want to hear your experience and. Cause you're, like. you're, you're running, you're running Boston this next, like 2020. Five, I right? hope so. I'm, I'm yeah. absolutely going to apply with my with my time from the last marathon, and I I hope I really hope to be running it that they accept me in there. So I I'm looking forward to everything that is Boston. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Alex and I were in Boston uh, in April and got to experience the dog and pony show in full effect. And, like we're hanging around <laughs> the expo and hanging around the finish hanging around the finish line the night before the race is the the ultimate. Uh, realization of this number three of why you shouldn't run a marathon is like you're standing there it's kind of pissing rain windy the last thing you should be doing is standing at the finish line outside the night before a marathon and there's like hundreds of people doing it and it's like this is a total gong show what are we all doing here i mean it's kind of fascinating and wonderful in its own way and 
Alex and I weren't running the marathon the next morning. We were only watching other people run a marathon uh, and talking and writing about it. But it definitely put into stark relief just how kind of like weird marathon running can be, particularly as a like a big ticket item, mm. uh, a New York, a Boston, that, a London, mm-hmm. that sort of thing. Yeah. And I don't want to feel like it talk, sound like a downer, but it was like when I saw someone the night before the race at the finish line, a little too peppy, a little too excited. I started doubting them a little because it's like, that's not how you're supposed to be the night before a race. If you've you trained for this, you should be resting. And also if you're, if you've trained hard for this, you should be focused. You should be a little bit nervous. You should be apprehensive about what's coming tomorrow. Right. And I knew that, you know, outside of these few hundred runners who were there, there were probably many more in their hotel rooms, visualizing the race, thinking about what they're going to do. That seems part and parcel with a long stint of training and then a race that you really care about. Yeah. There's something like both kind of wonderful and gross about the excessive aspect, particularly of the marathon majors. Like, you know, I don't mean to pick on Boston here, but because New York and they're all the same. London was the same as well. London was probably worse because there's more people, 50,000 plus people running the race. But you go to the expo and it's just like a total shit show. There's so many people there, all this stinky, nervous energy. Like, I, you know, I, I, I'm not a, uh, um, a biologist, I guess, but I, uh, a physiologist, but like, you can just smell all this, like, there's just this, like, nervous, I don't know, like, sweaty hormones floating around in the in the expo space the day before a marathon, because everyone's just, like, kind of amped up and, like, walking around and freaking out in their minds about what they're about <laughs> to do. But then they're also just, like, um, they're also consuming a huge amount of stuff while they're there. They're buying the jacket, the shirt, the shorts, the stuffed animal unicorn whatever right and it's kind of tacky and kind of gross and kind of weird and excessive but also kind of fascinating and again we all fall victim to this because you go caitlin you're going to experience this when you go to boston next year it's you get there and you're like well i've made it and part of the rite of passage of being a boston marathon qualifier and Boston marathon runner is you go and buy the jacket. And then when you're buying the jacket, you're like, this shirt is cute. And then you're (laughs) like, well, my kid would like a little stuffed unicorn. And then you're like, I could use a beer glass. Um, And then next thing you know, you've spent like $700 and you've been walking (laughs) around the expo for five hours. And that's weird. And it's a total dog and pony show. Uh, number four, we can just sort of skate over it's, you get all the benefits from a marathon while running, just, uh, marathon running by just going out for a run. We, we covered that one. I'd say number five, marathon training can lead to muscular imbalances. I don't know about this one. What do you guys think? In my experience, all running can lead to imbalances. (laughs) Yes. That's exactly what I was saying. We said we're we're on a roll today, Alex. We've been. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say. Running in general, I think that it maybe reveals muscular imbalances. Uh, I think that running any amount of with any amount of regularity, whether you're training for the marathon or not, will in time uh, reveal those imbalances or I mean, perhaps exacerbate them in some level. But also because it reveals them you can then work on them right it reveals imbalances that you otherwise would have neglected and then eventually you get older and things start breaking down naturally because um father time is undefeated and uh those muscular imbalances will come to haunt you in a different way for being a sedentary person so i don't know i don't i i think that that's okay i think that that's something that it's like a good thing to work through Um, so number six, marathon training takes up a significant amount of your free time. (laughs) No shit, huh? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It sure does. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm okay with that. I mean, you make the time to do, you make the time, right. And then you start thinking of your day differently. You know, most of us sleep for seven or eight hours and we don't, we don't think twice about it because it's a part of our day. 
we have dinner for an hour, we have lunch for 30 minutes, and now we fit running into it. I mean, I went through phases when work was incredibly busy and I never, I never got rid of my run, but sometimes I would come and think, yes, it would be nice to have that extra hour and do something else. But then I quickly realized, I think things would just go worse for me if I cut that hour run or even, even those two hours of training and then replace it with more work because, well, then you're mentally, you're not on if you're used to running and that's a part of your lifestyle. And so those eight hours of work could become 10 hours of work, but they're probably going to be 10 hours of shitty work if you're not, you know, physically, mentally regulated like you're used to be. So yeah, to me, it's, it's a, it's a concession that I make uh, at the end of my day, one hour, two hours, and it's, it's baked in there. It's a part, it might not be for everyone, but that's, that's what works for, for me. And I suppose a lot of marathon runners. Yeah. I mean, I think that that that's it. I mean, we, the, the three of us, it's just kind of a priority that we know we're going to work in the running. We know we're going to work in the strength training, whatever else we need to do, because we're really committed to it. And I think that if you really get excited for a marathon and you want to take on that goal, you have to be ready, but you should be excited about that time instead of thinking like, oh, it's going to be a ton of my time. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of other things. Well, then maybe you don't really want to run a marathon. Maybe you shouldn't take on this goal and you should take on, if you want to run, take on a, a shorter distance goal where maybe you could get away with running a bunch less. But if you want to take on the marathon, you should be like, yeah, it's going to take up all this time during the week, but I'm super excited about it. And I'm going to enjoy the training and I'm going to, you know, have to make some, some sacrifices to my other things, but it's going to be a positive thing. It's going to be positive sacrifices because I want to run. Yeah. And it's not like other people don't try to factor in other things in their lives too. Like, I feel like this podcast is just becoming all three of us justifying why we like running so much, but <laughs> I haven't met a single other person who has no regard for physical activity whatsoever. I don't think that exists in, you know, as long as, as long as you're able to, people will have some regard for physical activity, whether that's running or something else. And even if you're not a regular worker outer you're going to spend a lot of time telling yourself, oh, I should go to the gym today. Maybe I should try this boxing class. Or maybe, I, maybe I'll try getting a pair of running shoes and going for a run. And even if you're not in a routine, that constant decision making and bargaining with yourself is probably taking up as much time as running is. It's on everybody's mind. You need to exercise somehow. So in some ways, I think that it's easier to be in a routine because those decisions are already somewhat made for you. Yeah. And like, I mean, this is an honest question. I'm not asking this in a uh, smarmy way, but like, what would you guys do with the time if you didn't run? What would, what would you hmm. get into? What would you, what would you prioritize? What would fill up that time? Do you think you would actually carve out a chunk of time every day to practice or do something else in a conscious way that you you do with running well when i i've been injured for a year a, a year once uh so without much hope that i would come back to running and so my cross training then was not so much i want to stay fit for my next race it was i have it an hour at the end of my day and i enjoy how the exercise makes me feel so i guess i went through the experiment already this was six years ago and uh, I replaced it with with training. It was like my body, my mind wanted that hour of training. So even if I wasn't running, it would be a type of exercise for me. Yeah, absolutely. In agreement. And I think that this is part of our, I don't know, our all of all our crazy, our obsession, our, I don't know what we like to do. I don't know how to call it. But um, absolutely. We actually, I've had this conversation with a bunch of my friends who I, who I trail run with. And when we're on our long runs in the mountains, we're like, what would we do? Like if we weren't here all day Saturday and then go like, what, what would we do at the time? And not one of us has come up with an answer of something that we would rather be doing other than like be out in the mountains and on the trails. So maybe it sounds a little cheesy, but it's the truth. And I would probably look for something, um, some sort of sport to play as well. Maybe a team sport, maybe be like, all right, I'm going to get back into basketball or I'm going to play soccer again, or I'm going to do something that I would like to do, but it's most likely going to have to do with some sort of fitness or being outside or playing a game, some, some sort of physical activity. Hmm. Yeah. I think about 
I have a few different, a few friends who have written books and that requires that you kind of do something along the lines of what we're doing with marathon training or with any sort of like focused running training, uh, which is carving out a significant amount of time every single day and having that structure in place and it being no, there's no compromise around it where it's, I am doing this today and it has to happen. Uh, and the same thing goes for those that I know that have actually succeeded in writing a novel. For example, they, they said, I'm getting up every morning at this time. Usually it's quite early, especially if they've got like kids and a family to, to tend to every single day, they get up before everyone else gets up and they carve out that 90 minutes, two hours, one hour, whatever it is, five, six, seven days a week, very similar to marathon training where they focus on doing that work. And in many cases, it's kind of metaphorically or even kind of uh, abstractly a similar sort of approach where it's like some days are good, some days are not great, but it's all about putting the work in and getting it done. And then over the course of, actually, usually it's kind of the same amount of time, like say a third of a year, you put, you string something together and at the end you've got something coherent. And then you've got, in the case of writing a book, you've got a draft. In the case of a marathon, you've got all of this fitness to then go out and run the marathon. So I think that's cool. And I think that's great. And I think that I hope other people, it doesn't necessarily need to be a marathon, but like, I hope other people have this conscious desire to to challenge themselves with something and also to be a little bit uncompromising with one thing in their lives where they're like, I have a commitment to this and I am doing it on a daily basis. It's my practice. It's the thing I do, whatever that is. And I'm sort of like, uh, I'm, uh, I'm burning one of my, why you should run a marathon arguments mm -hmm. here. But <laughs> we'll get into that in a second. What, um, what would you do with the time, Michael? What would I do with the time? Uh, I, you know, I have other passions than, than running. Running is just one of them. Uh, I like to write. I mean, obviously we, the three of us are, are all, uh, we're all writers by trade, writers, editors by trade and professional thinkers, talkers, but I would, I would explore personal projects more. Um, and I have done that in the past where I've made running a secondary pursuit for a period of time and focused more on writing or, or other projects. I would do that kind of thing, but I like the idea of having a project of having a discipline every day. Um, yep. I think that it's super cool when I hear about somebody who's like, I go to the gym and I lift like, you know, however many days a week and they have it and it's really focused and it's really structured. And maybe you think those people are weirdos because they're like, you know, they've got no neck in their, uh, and they're like <laughs> walking around the gym and they've got the protein shake and whatever. But like my brother's a bodybuilder, so I know what go. it's like. Yeah. <laughs> like we're all weirdos, right? Yeah. This is life is a strange thing. So I, I think that that is no different than marathon training or any yep. other sort of concerted focused pursuit. And I think that's commendable and fascinating and it makes you a more interesting person in the process. Uh, it gives you something to do every day. Uh, okay, so number seven, we'll wrap up the last two here. Do you really need to prove to yourself that you can run a marathon? Question mark. Um, that's a great question. Mm. You know, I think that that's a, a a major personal question that you have to ask yourself if you're thinking about running a marathon, you're training for your first marathon, or maybe you've done 10 or 15 or 20 of them and you're just going back to the to the grind for another season. It's like, that's a really valid question to ask yourself. Do you really need to do this? Are you, what are you trying to prove to yourself? <laughs> mm. You know, and if it's purely just to prove something to yourself, like, I don't know, there's probably, there's maybe some therapy in there. I'm not, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. A, it's such a tough question. The way I read it was the key word that I took away from it was yourself. I think mm. I've met a lot of people who tried to prove to others that they could run a marathon. And I think mm -hmm. that's misguided because if you're doing it for other people, then you're probably more likely to skimp on training, take the shortcut, be that person who's, who does that stunt and enters a marathon without all that much training because you're in it for the badge. If you're trying to prove it to yourself, I think that's different. I have, 
I want to prove to myself that I could run a fast marathon for two reasons. I want to prove to myself that I can handle a fast pace for a long time. And I want to prove to myself that I can make it through a training cycle and many training cycles healthy. Those are two big goals of mine. And at the end of the day, it's like maybe I'll run a a 2XX. Time doesn't really matter. But to be able to finish a marathon in a time that I'm happy with is feels somewhat necessary to my running career the more I think about it. And the last one, and actually this ties in nicely, nice, nice, nice teeing up the segue there, Alex. I appreciate that. You didn't even know you're doing it. Number eight, the accomplishment can be a letdown. I feel this one, this one, I have an intimate, uh, experience with, I think we, we, I mean, there's, there's an actual phenomenon called post-marathon blues, which uh, I have experienced, I'm, I'm sure both of you have experienced it, uh, you know, post, I guess you could sort of more abstractly call it like post season, post competition blues, right? Where it's, it's the, and now what mm. feeling mm -hmm. that you get after you finish, right? You put all this work in, in the case of the marathon, it's 14, 16, 18, 20 weeks of work. And in many cases, it's more than that because it's, season over season and maybe you're finally at the precipice of a big breakthrough and then you achieve that breakthrough and it's gratifying and thrilling for 60 seconds after you cross the finish line <laughs> <laughs> and then you're like and now what now what do i do and then the next day you're sitting there at home you've flown back from chicago or boston or wherever or you know, you've finished the post-race brunch in your hometown where you've run your hometown marathon. And then you're like, okay, I guess I do that all over again. <laughs> like, have well, you guys yeah. experienced this? Do you know what I'm talking about? I know, the, the thing is, it's very funny because I actually don't, I don't feel that after, and of course I'm more generalizing with races in general, but even after this, this last marathon, because I always have the next plan in mind. I always have races planned out usually for the next year, like if everything goes as planned. So when I finish a race, I'm super excited about it. There's nothing more exhilarating than crossing a finish line, uh, unless I had a really tough race and still it's exhilarating cr to cross the finish line because I'm done. Um, and so I think the exciting part is then thinking, okay, I get a little bit of a break, but I've got this race in three or four months or five months. So now I've got to, you know, recoup and I've got another race and I've got another goal and I'm ready to go again. So I actually don't, it's funny. I don't feel like I get that feeling when I finish a race. It's more like, okay, now I know what's next and, and I'm excited about it. Hmm. Yeah. It's easier when you're a track athlete. Like I remember doing 1500 meters and there were so many races built into the season that no one race felt like such a big deal. I mean, you had the championship races, mm -hmm. but even then, you know, you take a week off and then you get back into the next season. So there wasn't a culminating point like the marathon is. And I, I don't, I don't know. I've done a, I've done a really good 10 K season two years ago and my final 10 K, I remember thinking, oh, all right, well, one week off and then back to it in the fall. It was a little anticlimactic, mm -hmm. but maybe I'll throw some armchair psychology your way. Process goals, outcome goals, process people, outcome people. Does that ring a bell? The people who are more so focused on the end goal, the end result, as opposed to people who might be a little bit more process driven. You know, they, mm -hmm. they gain more value from the training session or uh, learning how to improve their nutrition these little things. I assume if you're more of a process driven person, and I think that can be altered from inside of one person, right? You can learn to be an outcome driven person, a process driven person. But I think if someone is more inclined to think about the process, maybe that feeling of that, that crestfallen feeling at the end of the season is not as great because you're thinking more about, okay, what am I doing tomorrow? Tomorrow is a full rest day. What am I doing two days from now? Another rest day. Actually, I'm going to do that all week. I'll try to eat well. I'll try to go for walks. That'll be nice. That'll motivate me in a way. In two weeks, I'm going to do a little run. And it's, it yep. never really ends, right? So yes. 
Exactly. When I find myself in those mindsets, it kind of shields me from that. Oh, it's done. And, and oh, I missed my goal. Oh, this is awful. I have three, four months to wait now. And, and that's an awful way. I think it's an awful way to look at your at your running. You expose yourself to disappointment so much more. You've added a, a yet again, Alex. You're my segue man because uh, that's a nice way to wrap up the eight reasons why you should not run a marathon. Uh, because it segues nicely into just a couple of thoughts about why you should run a marathon and why you should be excited about running a marathon this fall coming up or whenever it is you're running a marathon. Um, and not thankfully, mercifully in the Western world, there are not that many marathons that are held in the summertime. So, uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I would say like right off the top, one of the things I wrote down was it adds structure and discipline to your life. And I think that those are really good things. Uh, I, I, we've talked a lot about that already. We've sort of talked about how it's nice to kind of have something to focus on and a goal within your otherwise, you know, pot potentially amorphous adult life of just, you know, doing work. And I don't think many people, I think one of the things that uh, many people discovered perhaps during the pandemic in particular was man, every day can bleed into the next day when you really think about it a lot. Right. And what's kind of neat about marathon running in particular is there's a big goal at the end of the season. There's this whole process that you have to go through. Um, and you have to develop yourself as a, you know, physically as an athlete, but also mentally, emotionally through this process as well. You get to learn a lot of things and you get to put yourself on a little bit of a set of rails, which I think is great, especially for someone like myself who desperately needs structure imposed upon them mm -hmm. at all times. Um, and uh, another one I wrote down is you meet so many fascinating people running marathons. That's I think one. one of the most powerful things that I've experienced in the last 15 or so years doing this is it creates this incredible leveling effect socioeconomically. Like I think about the different, I, I just jotted down here, the different careers of people that I've inter interacted with mm. or I've gone for a run with or trained with over the years. I've run with an electrician, a surgeon, an Olympic gold medalist in not in running, not in track or, or, or the marathon, someone who was homeless at the time. I've run with lots of teachers, professors, too many engineers, uh, a New York times bestselling author, a pilot, an Olympic level coach in a non running sport, a lot of accountants, a lot of a type people, big and small animal vets, both. Uh, so I've talked about, I've talked about uh, uh, birthing a cow during a long run as a subject of like, yep, yeah, we just we uh, we had a breach that we had to deal with. Uh, I had to go out to the farm, and uh, yeah, so like just the craziest, weirdest conversations. Uh, I ran with a, a defense contractor once, which was an interesting talk. Um, and I've run with like high level politicians. So like, that's, that is the whole gamut of, uh, how much, you know, socioeconomically where they are on the, on the, the, the hierarchy of, you know, wealth to poverty and, uh, different perspectives, different political perspectives, different life experiences, different backgrounds. And the long run in particular for me running with all these different people that you're kind of thrown into the mix with, especially if you train with a group of people, a club, a training group, that sort of thing is you come to realize that like every Sunday for your long run is kind of like the weirdest, most random and fascinating podcast, right? Because you've got this like weird cast of characters and you're just, you just start talking about what's going on in your lives. And it's, these are people you would never interact with for the most part, if it weren't for running and if it weren't for the, discipline and structure of the marathon cycle. Right. So mm. I think that's really cool. Like, I mean, I'm sure you guys have run with all sorts of different, different folks, uh, over the years. It's funny. You mentioned Michael about the cow, because I was actually running, I was actually uh, in a, on a trail run at a farm. And one of the, the, the guys that run with us, he works in agriculture and he has coffee plantations and he has cows and the cow was actually giving birth when we, <laughs> 
passed by him and he was there helping the cow. Oh. So that's something. <laughs> he was there actually helping the birth of the cow, the calf. So, um, so he's like waving and he's like, yeah. we're good. I got it. Yeah. Don't worry. It's Keep a boy. Going, guys. Yeah. <laughs> totally. So what, like yeah. you were passing and then the, the farmer was like, Hey, are any of you a large animal vet? And he was like, yeah, I am. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually his farm. Oh. And they had they had given him a call. We were actually doing a run on his farm. What they've done to the farm is that they've they've opened it up also to the public uh for trails. So there's trails that run all throughout this awesome farm and plenty of hills and plenty of beautiful green to see. And um they had to give him a call as we were getting started and he had to go ahead to this area, but it was actually a place where we actually ran by as the running club and he was there helping out and we were like, Hey, all right, yeah, here we go. Join us back again when you can. <laughs> so here you go. Multiple cow birth stories. Can't because believe of it. running on this no. podcast today. Wow. I mean, there you go. It's like wait a couple of days, I'll have another I'm running with a large animal vet on Saturday, so I'll report back next week. Although I'm in downtown Toronto, so I doubt that he'll be as solicited during the run. But, okay, can I point something out here? Yeah. We're, yeah. we're talking about all these benefits of marathoning, you know, meeting new people, going, you know, learning discipline, uh, having good conversations on Sunday mornings. None of that has to do with the race itself. It has to do with the training. I look at Thomas's yeah. article and, Process. you know, poor Thomas, he's got three editors picking his article apart and he's not here to defend himself. That's like the, every writer's nightmare. Uh, but I think his, his, his eight reasons, they don't convince me to not run a marathon. They convince me to not run a marathon without training. They convince me to not just hop into a marathon willy nilly. And I think, and that's what he means. I mean, look, we're the marathon handbook. He's not telling people not to run a marathon. I think he's telling people don't run a marathon if you're not ready to pay the cost to, to, to go through the process. Yeah, totally. I th yeah. And I think that that is, there's sort of two different, like that's the, the, the elephant in the room here is that there's two different types of marathon running, right? There's like structured marathon running where you go in and you, you, you prepare to run a marathon, you go through a training cycle. And then there's the, I think a, a, a form of marathon, like bucket listing a marathon where you like, maybe don't train at all, or you don't do any sort of structured training. And then you drag yourself through it. And then you can kind of brag about it afterwards at, at like work the next on Monday morning. You're like, I ran a marathon over the weekend. And everyone's like, Oh my God, you ran a marathon. And you're like, yeah, it was <laughs> awful. It took forever. My legs are killing me. Uh, I drank so many beers afterwards, right? Like that's like, that's one type of the marathon. I don't think any of us are talking about that or condoning that. Uh, I, I think, you know, Hey, do as you please suffer for several hours on a Sunday morning if you want to. Uh, but there's a different way. There's a different path. Uh, last couple ones I got here. Uh, it, one is you have a different relationship with, where you live than probably many other people that, you know, certainly non runners like, and this isn't, I guess not, uh, not purely for marathon training, but I mean, marathon training usually implies that you run a lot and you run pretty far distances, particularly once a week for the long run. You just get to see parts of the, if you live in a city, you just get to see parts of a city that many of your peers never get to see. Uh, you find yourself in places from time to time that, you would never have found yourself in otherwise. So you develop this unusual relationship with where you live. And then also when you travel, you, uh, you get to see a city, you get to see way more of a city when you travel. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, as an example, I did this weird road trip across the United States with a friend of mine over the course of a couple of weeks, about 10 years ago. And we stopped at the end of every day of driving, my one uh, stipulation was that I was going to put in at least 60 or 60 to 80 minutes a day running at the end of every day or before we left every morning. It was usually the end of every day because I would put it off in the morning. And we would pull into some like Tulsa or wherever and I would get out of the car and I would go for a like 10 mile run. Uh, through some random area in the outskirts of 
you know, Tulsa was one that comes to mind. <laughs> I got to see the Waffle House on the outskirts of Tulsa and its bathroom. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you get to experience these places that you would never see otherwise. And that I come back and I'm like, I saw this crazy shit. And my friend didn't get to see any of it because he was just, you know, hanging out in the, in the motel room waiting for the next day. Right. So I think that's a neat thing. And I think the final thing here is, uh, I think it's really important to escape technology as much as possible as we talk to each other mm -hmm. through a camera and a computer screen, uh, recording a podcast. But I think that whenever possible, go for a run without AirPods stuck in and just go for a run. And I think that that's an extraordinary experience. I think it's a fundamental, basic and profound experience. Uh, and I think that there is something really unhealthy about the way we live our lives for the most part, most of us with technology, our relationship with technology is fucked. And, uh, I think that running unfucks that at least temporarily. So, uh, that's, I think a reason why, and I know that's just not just marathon training, it's running, but sort of equating the amount of time you have to do, put into to marathon train, uh, as being a benefit in that regard. Mm, I'm with you there. I actually think the, the hour plus of training I do a day regulates me and gets me off my, gets me off my phone, sets me up for the next day. I actually like to do it at the end of the day because, you know, my, my head is two different versions before the run and after the run, just because there's so much, mm -hmm. so many notifications coming my way during the day. Like me, like for everybody. Yeah. And I mean, I, so I've got a six year old and there's a lot of time spent in early childhood education, talking about teaching children how to self-regulate. It's a big component of the curriculum, uh, where you're trying to, to, um, instill in a child ways of them understanding their own emotions and what they're experiencing and ways of grounding that and putting it into perspective and also ways to self soothe self like calm themselves. These are all things that I think in some cases we are get obliterated or lost, uh, as adults with particularly with technology, which is basically these devices are like anxiety causing devices and particularly with social media. And, um, and I think running, does a, I mean, just because hopefully you just leave your phone at home or, you know, occasionally come take us with you and listen to us, but like not every day. And we only do one podcast a week. So, but just leave your phone at home and go for a run. Uh, and I mean, if you're really, if you're really next level, like just leave the Garmin or the Apple watch at home too. And just like, just run a distance, you know, and then come back and don't worry about it. But that's a, that's a tough one. That's, that's a another tough level. One. That's yeah. a totally, that is like Zen master of running yeah. to be able to just run without a watch all the time. But it's I, impressive. I don't, I don't know many people that. <laughs> no. All right, guys. I think that's, we've covered the bases. The article is called eight reasons why you shouldn't run a marathon. It is written by our teammate, Thomas Watson, who is the founder of marathon handbook. And it's an awesome article. And it's, I think. Alex, as you rightly point out, it it's speaking really specifically about why you shouldn't run a marathon if you're not ready to run a marathon. Not so much you shouldn't be running a marathon because yep. we don't feel that way. Check it out if you've not already read the article. It's on our site. And we shared it on Tuesday in our five days a week, five, uh, what's, fa what's uh, twice, thrice, I'm not going to go. The newsletter goes out week. five days a week. <laughs> goes out at 5.55 in the morning Eastern mm -hmm. time. So it's there in your inbox when you wake up, unless you're Caitlin and you wake up in the middle of the night to run. <laughs> and uh, our podcast. Every Friday, we're locked into the Friday morning drop now. Friday morning, right around that same time, 5.55, 6. We actually will plunk the, the latest episode of the podcast in the newsletter, just in case you've forgotten about it and uh, subscribe, uh, give us five stars as well. It's really, really helping us grow what we do. Uh, we're connecting with a lot of different people out there. It's a lot of fun what we've been doing. And uh, we've got a video version of our podcast that you can watch on YouTube. And now you can watch it on Spotify as well. Spotify does a video feed of the podcast. 
and we've been diligently uploading all of the back catalog of our previous episodes as videos and also every video moving forward will be available on on Spotify as well as a podcast. So, uh, and follow us on our socials. Make sure you check out Alex's videos on YouTube. He does these amazing shoe reviews. He's got the top five shoes of 2024 so far, which is just like total fire. Absolutely excellent. Got to check it out. Go to our YouTube channel, uh, search Marathon Handbook in YouTube and you'll find us there. All right. Thanks gang. And we'll talk soon.